When you remember what God has done for us in the past, it's hard not to be thankful, isn't it? Maybe not from y'all, but for me, when I look, remember what God has done for me in the past, my gratefulness just seems to come to the top because that's all the emotion I have is gratefulness for his grace because he's brought me through so much. Sing this with me if you know it. We will remember we will remember, we will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise, for great is thy faithfulness. I'll sing that with me.
If it wasn't for that day, none of the rest of it would amount to anything. But I still remember the day he saved me. I still remember the day you saved me. The day I heard you call out my name. You said you loved me. So let us 
Aren't you grateful? You may be seated. I was, um, as I was thinking about this service, you know, they talk a lot about Christmas in July. And uh, this morning we're having Thanksgiving in July, but I don't know who's doing the turkey. Um, let me know. Let me know, because I, I, I have no plans for lunch, so I'd be happy to come eat your turkey with you. But are you, are you grateful this morning? A few years ago, uh, go ahead, give me some talking music right there. Um, a few years ago, we first moved into this building. Do you remember that uh, Shane Hunt got up and talked about their family does the top 10 days of, their, of the year? Do you remember that? And he said they made a list, and, and that year was the year we moved into this new building. And he said that at least two or three of those days had to do with, with, with this church. And he, he was trying to raise money. I'm not trying to raise money, so just relax, okay? Just relax. He was, he was going for pledges, and he was just saying how important the church is to our lives. So give, okay? I'm not telling you that. I'm saying the church is important to our lives, and be grateful when you think back about the day. So we have taken, our family has taken what Shane Hunt talked about. Um, not, we don't write books at our house. We read books, all the pages most times. But the past couple years, we've, we've made our top ten lists of the things that we're grateful for. And you know, sometimes as I'm looking at, at my life, Katrina and I will talk about this circumstance or, th or that circumstance, and we'll say, you know, it's still not where we want it to be, but think about where it was just recently. Do you have things about like that in your life? Where you're like, you know, let's celebrate what God has done in our lives. Even though it may not be perfect, even though he may not have moved that thing. You remember Paul? Paul prayed how many times about the thorn in his flesh, and God never did take it away from him. Yet he was grateful in spite of it. Amen? So this morning, we're not gathered around a table. We don't have a turkey. Well, we have some turkeys, but not the kind you eat. But let's think about what God has done in your life, in my life. In Lamentations, it says this, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You know, that would sound so much better if you'd say that with me. Read that with me, would you? Because, because of the Lord's, Lord's great, great love, love, we are not consumed, not consumed for his, his compassions, compassions never fail. fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I hope you're grateful this morning. I hope you can find something to say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what you've done for me. In spite of whatever circumstances they may be, Lord, you've been good to us. Would you sing this with me? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. See, 
winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. verse pardon for sin pardon for sin and a peace that endure thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow Blessings of mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Yes. 
satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough. give thanks that he is more than enough do we not Amen. Amen. I'm glad that you're here today and I hope that already through this part of the service he has spoken to your heart he has ministered to you and drawn you closer to him in your prayer list your that is in your worship folder we have a number of people that we are praying for and praying with Tina Eggers came through surgery just fine this week and is recovering John McFarland found out the date for his uh, next follow-up surgery, which will be August 6th, a week from tomorrow. Boyce is continuing to improve and able to be with us today and not receive text at home during prayer time. <laughs> Boyce was surprised that he got a, two or three texts a couple of weeks ago when I asked you to text somebody after prayer. He said, why weren't they paying attention? Why weren't they in the service why weren't they locked in and Lori had to explain pastor Ken told them to do it so uh, boys we're glad you're back continuing to pray for Glenda Romine who is also here today praying for Javane the two of them had some serious skin cancer removed and then we're praying for Summer Hampton we had Stephen on the prayer list we've had Maddox on the prayer list and Summer was a little jealous so she stepped off a curb this week broke her ankle so she could be put on the prayer list and uh, no that is not that is not the reason behind it but we need to pray with and pray for her there are many other requests many other situations that we're taking to the father in prayer today as well as that personal list that you have that perhaps cannot be shared but we take all of these things to one who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine so as we go to prayer, let's stand together. And if you'd like to come and kneel at the altar during the prayer time, you're welcome to come as we sing. And all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need. You satisfy me with your love and all I but you is more than enough. And all of you is more than enough for all of me, for every thirst and every need. You satisfy me with your love. And all I have in you is more than enough. Father, you are the one who has promised that you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory through your Son, Christ Jesus. And it's in the name of Jesus that we bow before you today. It's in his name that we lift our prayers, our concerns, our needs to you. It's in the name of Jesus that we have gathered in this place of worship today. And it's in the name of Jesus that we understand that our relationship with you is made possible. We do not take that for granted. We do not take it lightly. But rather, we stand amazed in your presence right now amazed that you love us the way you do, amazed that you would allow your son to die on a cross on our behalf, amazed that you're always with us, and amazed that you provide for us the way that you do. Why wouldn't we want to be in a loving relationship with a heavenly father like that, one who stands by us when we go through times of testing and trials, one who provides in time of need, one who showers us with your love and compassion, one who brings peace to the heart and mind during times of turmoil. Thank you. Thank you for being that God and so much more. 
And we do lift these individual needs to you today, asking you to go to each and every one of them. Thanking you for what you've done for these who have come through surgery, praying for others who have surgeries ahead of them. Praying for some who've been on this list just a few days and others who have been on this prayer list for months, perhaps years. But in every case, you're the God of all these situations. You're the one who can make things happen. You're the one who hears and answers prayer. You're the one who works in ways that go beyond our understanding or comprehension. And so for these things that we, we don't even have the wisdom enough to know to ask for right now, would you provide according to your will and your best? As we continue to worship you, may we be drawn closer and closer to you. May our relationship be stronger when we leave this place than it was when we came in. And for all that you do, for the mighty ways that you work, we will give you the thanks, the praise, the honor, the glory, for you deserve all this and so much more. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray this prayer. Amen. Sing this with us before you sit down. We will remember, we will remember, we will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise for great is thy faithfulness. Sing it out one more time. You may be seated. Well, what a pleasure to have all of you here today. Thank you for coming. Some people drove here from the Houston area in order to be with us today, and it's good to have Rick and Marilyn Collar back home. I don't know what they call home now, but we call this home for them. And they're on their way from Houston to New York and stopped in to worship with us today. Glad to have you. Good to see you again. This morning, if you're worshiping with us as a, as a guest and did not have the opportunity to register at the Greeter Center, I would ask that you take the response form that is in the front of your worship folder and just put your name and some contact information on there. We would like to make contact with you later in the week, and thank you for coming to be with us today. Also, on that response form, there is one, one little area that you can respond to that says, I wish to participate in the baptism service on September 2nd. If you have not been baptized, if you would like to be part of this baptism class for September 2nd, would you just put your name and your phone number and a check mark indicating that you would like to be baptized and we will make contact with you and make sure that you are part of this upcoming baptism class. We would thoroughly enjoy the opportunity to celebrate Christian baptism with any of you who have not experienced that, have not made a public testimony of your confession of faith. I'd like to ask the ushers to come, and I'd like to ask Emily Sheets to come. How many of you have met Emily? If you have a little one in the nursery, you probably have. Emily has been helping us this summer as a nursery worker on Wednesday nights and Sunday morning. We decided to bring her out in public. She has passed the test of uh, seclusion. Actually, Emily is a college student who was looking for a summer job and a friend of Shelley Gibson and um, has, has been here through the summer. Our, okay, don't get me wrong. Our nursery position will not support a college student full time, okay? But she just loves kids, wanted something to do, and needed, needed a place to serve. And she has been doing that faithfully. She'll be attending Trevecca Nazarene University um, in the fall. She is a music major. And we just thought you would enjoy her ministry of music this morning. And Emily, we are glad to have you. Thanks for being here. 
and thanks for helping us all. Absolutely, definitely a blessing in my life, that's for sure. Father, we pray that as we worship through giving, that your touch will be upon each and every one of us. That as we give back to you just a portion of what you've so generously blessed us with, that you will take our offering and do with it what we cannot. Allow hearts to be changed, lives to be transformed. Would you touch lives in places around the world that we probably will never be able to go? But you are there. You're working in miraculous ways. So bless this offering. Use it and change lives as a result of it. We pray in your great name. Amen. Thank you, Emily. <clears throat>
thank you for your ministry to us today, and thanks for bringing your family with you today. Good to have her parents and her sister with us. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> this morning, I'd like for us to look at the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And Danielle, I'm going to need your help because I have no clicker. Let's go to John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, and stand as we read the word together. <clears throat> Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated and gave as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Father, we pray that you will be the one who speaks to our hearts today. May your Holy Spirit minister to us individually, and may your voice be heard above all others. We pray in your great name. Amen. <clears throat> there are some interesting things that children have said over the years as they come out of Sunday school or come out of a church service. For instance, do you know Noah's wife's name? Help me out, Danielle. Noah's wife was called Joan of Arc. Or do you know the greatest miracle in the Bible? It is when Joshua told his son to stand still and his son obeyed. <laughs> or the one that uh, ties into today is a child came out of Sunday school and he said, they said, what did you learn about in Sunday school? And he said, the feeding of the 5,000, which is the story of the crowd that loafs and fishes. <laughs> well, that's where we are right now. Not exactly loafing and fishing, but about loaves and fish. Today's scripture takes place on the Sea of Galilee. Not a very large sea by by geographic standards, probably eight miles at the widest, 13 miles long. But to have some quiet time for himself and his disciples, Jesus had crossed over to the other side of that body of water. But as soon as he got there, a crowd began to gather. The crowd followed him because of what he had been doing. His popularity was growing. The word was coming out. This, this man was, was extraordinary in many ways, and the crowd followed. They would not leave him alone. And in those days, people didn't work according to a clock as we do today. They didn't punch a clock. Many of them worked for themselves. They had a farm. They had a small business. They perhaps owned some fishing boats. Whatever the case may be, it was a situation where they were not necessarily responding to someone else, but they were able to lay aside what they were doing for a little while and follow Jesus. They followed him to the other side 
of the Sea of Galilee. Verse 3 tells us that Jesus had gone up on a mountainside where he was sitting down to talk to his disciples. And when he saw the great crowd gathering, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now there's a good question, but I want you to look at the question carefully. I want you to look at exactly what was said and the way Jesus worded it. The people have traveled a distance. But his question is, how are we going to feed them? Where can we buy bread? Not where can we send them, not where can they go to get something. Where can we get bread? Where can we take care of this need? The implication is that Jesus and the disciples were going to provide a meal for about 5,000 plus people. And the answer, well, I've got to be honest with you. The disciples started their process of thinking through this situation much like I do at times. And it's probably the same with you. When something needs to be done, when some big task needs to be accomplished, when some miracle is waiting to happen, where do we start in our thinking? We start with what cannot be done. Hmm? Is that all bad? Well, not exactly, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But we start with what can't be done, and that's exactly, <clears throat> that's exactly what Philip did. Are you kidding me? There's not enough money in the account for us to feed this many people. It would take eight months' wages to give them all just one bite. There's Andrew. Andrew has a response. Yeah, yeah, I saw a kid with two fish and five loaves of, of bread, but what in the world are you going to do with that? Look at how many people are here. We couldn't even feed a crowd this size with five loaves and two fish. What are you going to do with 5,000 plus people who are gathered on a hillside waiting to be fed? What, what Andrew is really saying is, I saw some food, but it's definitely not enough. It's not enough for us to take care of this situation. Here's what we cannot do. We don't have enough money. Here's what we cannot do. We do not have enough food. Here's what we cannot do, which is probably an appropriate way to proceed. But on second thought, this is really not a bad way to go. You see, sometimes we need to understand our limitations in order to appreciate our great God. Sometimes we need to be put in places of impossibility from the human perspective in order to see and appreciate when God demonstrates his great ability. Sometimes we need to be put in places where we are reminded that we are not the God of our life. He is the God of our life. He is the Lord of our life and we surrender to him. And in doing so, we discover not only our limitations, but his great ability. Because impossible situations are his specialty. That's what he specializes in. And there are other things that can be learned from, from this passage of scripture, such as how God used only a little to bless a lot of people, how the disciples didn't think they had enough, but when they put it in God's hands, it became more than enough. And how the lad was willing to give everything that he had to Jesus at that moment, not knowing if he would ever get anything in return. Those are all good lessons that come from this passage of Scripture. But here's where I want us to go today. No matter what your age Everyone has something to give to Jesus. From the youngest to the oldest here today, from the youngest to the oldest in our community, from the youngest to the oldest, everyone has something to give to Jesus. Too often we think in terms of giving being in dollars and cents. But giving to Jesus is much more than money. In addition to our tithe, we give our time, our talent, and our testimony. We share our story of what God has done with us. We share our talents. We give of our time in so many different ways. 
And over the next few weeks, you're going to have the opportunity to experience some amazing gifts that are being offered to God. For instance, this really sounds a little bit like what Aaron should be doing at the end of the service, but stay with me just a moment. On August the 5th, there's the children's musical. Are you ready? Are you ready to come in and watch the kids perform? I hope not. I hope what you're ready to do is witness our children giving their best to God. Giving of themselves, and they've been practicing for months. They've been practicing and rehearsing and going over music and practicing and memorizing lines. And next Sunday, they are going to give of themselves to us. They're giving a gift to Jesus. It's not bread, it's not fish, it's their talent. And they are going to stand up here on this platform and sing and present a drama that will minister to you. And I hope you come not expecting to be entertained, but expecting to be ministered to and expecting to appreciate what it is that our children have to give to Jesus. How about the next week? By the way, let me back up just a minute. The, not, the title of the, the program is Danny and the Shacks. I have not listened to it. Linda has been rehearsing with the kids for months. I have not listened to it. But it has my, my curiosity peaked. Danny and the Shacks, be here 9.30 next Sunday morning between 25 and 30 children on this platform presenting that musical. The following week, August the 12th. Are you ready? Are you ready to find out what some young people from this congregation have been doing this summer? In Uganda, Hot Springs, South Africa, Tampa, Florida, Dominican Republic, Honduras. Some of them are go going to be here telling us what God did for them during their mission trip during the summer. It isn't about them, them alone. It is about what God has done through them. What did God do to the people they ministered to? What, how did God speak to these young people as they were ministering? On August the 12th, we're, we're going to hear and, and think this through. Think this through, please. Five of, these, five of these young people left the state. Alex Jarvis went to Tampa, Florida. The other four that I'm talking about went out of the country. How many of you ever had an opportunity in college or just out of college to take a mission trip out of the country? Two, three, four, not very many. How many of you feel as if you are part of this trip that was made by these young people? All of you should, because all of us have invested in their lives. All of us have been teaching and training and helping bring them along. All of us have been partnering with their parents to, to help put in their heart a desire for serving Jesus Christ in this, in this manner and in this way. We all had a part in it. <laughs> and we all get to hear what Christ has done through these young people on the 12th. Then the 19th. The 19th is back to school Sunday. We've had back to school Sunday for several years. Pastor Pete has been our, our speaker on those Sundays. But we've expanded it. How many of you noticed some little yard signs in the yard when you drove up this morning? Ah, the rest of you, I want to be careful of meeting you on the street <laughs> while you're driving. I hope you notice something different out on the lawn. Some signs telling you about what's happening August 19th. It's back to school 2.0. We're introducing an emphasis that goes from nursery through high school entitled, It's Just a Phase, Don't Miss It. Do not raise your hand on this one, okay? 
I don't want anyone embarrassing themselves. But how many of us have been in conversation with parents who are struggling with a child? It may be a two-year-old. It may be a three-year-old going through the terrible twos. It may be a teenager going through the transition of life. It may be, it may be dating relationships. It may be, it may be, it may be a number of things. And here is the response. Here is the response that too often we give to parents who are struggling a little bit. We say to them, oh, it's just a phase. It'll pass. It's just a phase. They'll grow out of it. It's just a phase. They'll get through it, and you will too. Well, that may be comforting in a way, but if your children were like our children, and I think they were, when they got out of this phase, they entered this phase. And then when they got out of this phase, they entered this phase. And if you spend your life waiting on your child to just get out of a phase, you're going to waste your parenting years watching them just pass from phase to phase without any guidance, without any direction, without any help. And on August 19th, we're going to introduce It's Just a Phase, Don't Miss It. Don't miss the opportunity to do some training and teaching in the life of your child. Don't miss the opportunity to instill some principles that are important in their development and their maturing. Don't miss the opportunity that God is giving you while your child is in this phase. Yes, it's just a phase, but don't miss it. And to go along with that, extend an invitation. Extend an invitation to parents that you know who are struggling with parenting their children. Maybe not struggling. Maybe struggling is the wrong word. Who are being challenged. Or maybe it's parents that things are going well right now, but they need to be prepared for the next phase. This is an opportunity of outreach. This is an opportunity not just for Forest Home people, but for people from our community. And I hope that you will be extending an invitation for people to join us on August 19th. Then we've had children's camp. We've had teen camp. Parents, you'll be given the opportunity to sign up for parenting camp. I didn't hear one amen. <laughs> Grandparents are welcome to sign up as well. And there will be three sessions in September, on Sunday afternoons in September, that will give you the opportunity to learn more about it's a phase, don't miss it. But everybody has something to give including children and teens. But in order for them to have the opportunity to give to Jesus, we must train them. We must encourage them. We must mentor them. We must pray for them. And then we must send them out. Because God has something in store for all of us through their lives. I'll tell you what I mean by telling you this story. Anybody know the name Samuel Wesley? We're Wesleyan in our background, in our theology. Anybody know the name Wesley? Anybody know Samuel? Samuel was Susanna's husband. Samuel was a preacher. Samuel was John and Charles' father. Samuel was like so many of us. He had a burning desire in his heart to see the church renewed and revived. And one day he was studying and praying while, his, while two of his small children, John and Charles, were playing on the stairway. They were doing what little boys normally do, making lots of racket, lots of noise, the kind of noise, the kind of racket that would interrupt a pastor who was trying to pray and trying to put a sermon together. Finally, Dad had had all he could stand. And he stepped out of his office in his house. He looked at the two boys and he said, go play somewhere else. I'm trying to pray for a great revival to come upon the church and your noise is disturbing to me. Little did he know, little did he know that one of the greatest movements in religious history 
was sparked by those two boys that he said, move on, your noise is making, is disturbing me. John and Charles Wesley were the answer to his prayer. The boys in his home were the answer to his prayer. Those two young men grew up to lead a movement of religion not only in Europe but across the Atlantic and came to the United States. We don't know. We don't know who it is that's living in the home with us. We don't know who it is that will be on this platform with us next Sunday. We don't know how God intends to use these young people who have been on mission trips for the past several weeks. We don't know all that God has in store, but we do know that God has a plan for them and God has used us to help raise them up to be at the place they are right now. I wish you could hear some of the comments that Linda gets from people who are no longer in children's musicals. Miss Linda, do you remember that one we did when I was a fifth grader? She remembers they were fifth graders once. She can't remember every musical. But they give her the title and they give her some segment out of it and it clicks with her because it has stayed in their hearts and in their minds. We never know, we never understand, we never perceive, we never really grasp until later on what has been learned in the heart of a child as a result of the investments that we have made as a church, as a result of the investments that we have made as parents. E.T. Sullivan has written, when God wants a great work done in the world or a great wrong made right, he goes about it in a very unusual way. He doesn't stir up his earthquakes or send for his thunderbolts. Instead, he has a helpless baby born, perhaps in a simple home and of obscure parents. And then God puts the idea into a mother or father's heart, and they put it into the baby's mind. And then God waits. The greatest forces in the world are not the earthquake, and the thunderbolts. The greatest forces in the world are our children. Indeed, everyone in this church has something to give to Jesus in these days. And a wise person once said, and I have this quote for you on the screen, our life is God's gift to us. What we make of life is our gift to God. The fun part will come as we watch him take it, bless it, and use it. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? What do you have to give? What are you giving? What have you given to Jesus? Most of us in this room today have given in many different ways because we know that he gave to us first. But how is it that God wants to use your life? How is it that God wants to make a difference through you? How is it that God wants to make a difference in the lives of your children, your grandchildren? How's that going? Would you take just a moment through silent prayer to commit to him to be a vessel that he can use, to be a tool that he can make use of, that you're going to do anything and everything that he may ask of you that you'll give in any way you can back to him. Because you recognize his love for you right now.
Father, what we have may seem like a few loaves and a couple of fish, and you need to feed thousands of people. We're not sure what difference our gift will make, but we offer it to you. We offer it to you just as this little boy did in this story today, where you took the gift and made more of it than could ever be imagined. We take our lives. They look so small. But when our lives are given totally and completely to you, there's so much that can be done. Take us, use us, shape us, mold us, send us. Whatever it is you need to do in our hearts and lives today, we give you permission. We give you permission to make a difference in us so that you can make a difference through us in this community, around the world, wherever it may be. Help us to be people who make a difference in your great name. Help us to look for ways to be used by you. Help us, Father, to be at our best in kingdom service. And for all that you do, for the ways that you work, for the change that you bring about in every heart and every life, we will thank you and praise you, for it's in the name of Jesus that we ask this today. And all the people said, amen. Let's stand together. <laughs> Sing this with us. Who am I that he would love us? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. Oh, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died.
sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Sing in my Father's house. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Somebody say amen. Amen. Can I hear just the voices sing that? I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. That last line, yes, I am who you say I am. You know, this week the devil's going to come sit on some of your shoulders. He will. I mean, he does it to me. Maybe he doesn't do it to you. And sometimes they say, you know, Aaron, you're not good enough. You know, Aaron, you messed up there. You know, Aaron, nobody really listens to you anyways. And you know what? I'm just going to point, point it back to that scripture, or to, the, to those verses. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. He loves you this morning. Amen? Amen. Sit down if you're, done, if you're tired of listening to me talk. I'm going to keep talking, but you might as well sit down. Hey, we've got lots of things going on around here. Pastor Ken's already told you most of them. I don't even know why I'm here. Next week, I'm going to preach his sermon during the music part. <laughs> it's the children's musical. I get the week off. Hey, he, he already told you about this. Um, it's, it's, it's three weeks from today. It's just a phase. Plan on being here. Plan on being here. Don't, don't check out. Sometimes you all hear things and you, and you say, you know, that's just for parents or grandparents, and I'm neither one, so I'm not going. You need to be here, okay? Like he said, um, the, the, the week before that, on the 12th, you can go ahead and show them that, that, the, the, the mission Sunday. That is, uh, that is because of the investment as a church you have put into these young people. Even my kids. My kids have only been here for three years, and you all have invested in them. You've invested in them financially. You've invested in them emotionally. You've prayed for them. And this, and this on, on August the 12th, that's the day when we celebrate the investment that, that, that we have made in our kids. So thank you so much. Next Sunday, next Sunday night, Triumphant Quartet's going to be here. Plan on being here. Tell a friend about it. It's good. It's good. Triumphant Quartet, if you don't know who they are, um, they are one of the top groups in their genre. They're voted the number one group uh, for many years, and they're excellent. If you, don't, um, if you don't think you like this kind of music, come anyways, and you'll get all your money back if you don't care for it. There are no tickets required. Next Sunday morning is uh, the children's musical. You've heard about that too, and that's going to be lots and lots of fun. You, can I tell you one of the things I'm grateful for? I'm grateful for a church that cares about their kids. I'm grateful for a church that has kids. A lot of churches don't have kids these days. I'm grateful for a church that has kids, and I'm grateful for a church who invests in their children, and this place invests in their children as well as anybody I know. I call her Mother Superior because that's what she likes for me to call her, Linda, Linda Stallings. You can call her uh, Reverend Mother if you want, but she loves your kids more than anybody else that I know, and she invests in them, and we're thankful for that. That's next Sunday morning, 930. Be here early if you want a seat. Finally, I have been telling you about this for nearly a month, and I still hear some wavering. You know what? I don't even care anymore. If you don't want to go to the ladies' retreat, don't go. There's going to be private jokes going on all year long because you didn't go to ladies' retreat, and you don't even know what they're talking about, Okay. So if you're a lady, today's your last day. After this, you don't even get to hear me talk about it anymore, but I really wish you'd go because I've told you why. Your husbands need a break, okay? They want you to go, but it's going to be good. There's going to be lots and lots of good stuff that goes on there, so plan on being there. And today, Pastor, remember back in May when you didn't get elected to the board and you wish you'd gotten elected to the board? Pastor needs to see all the board members today, so you'll be glad. You can go to lunch 
but the board members need to stay right at noon in the legacy classroom right over here. Pastor needs to see you. You're not even allowed to sit down, okay? There, but there is isn't a matter of business that he needs to attend to, and it's very important we need to get that done today. So please, if you're on the church board, please show up to that meeting. We need a quorum, okay? You know what that means? I really don't, but I think that's what you're supposed to say. So plan on being there. Plan on being there uh, at noon, right after Sunday school. Go directly there. He's not going to have you sit down. It's going to be a really quick meeting, and you can still be at lunch, hopefully ahead of the Baptist, but I can't promise you that. Thank you so much for being here. Grab a cup of coffee. Go to Sunday school. Have a good day.